Welcome to Science Frontiers, a space for discussions in the frontier areas of science and technology. I am your host, Binay Panda. Science is considered a noble profession and scientists are held in high esteem in most societies. However, scientists like any other human beings come under pressure. Sometimes the greed or the temptation of becoming famous or discovering new drugs, vaccines or cure for diseases make them take shortcuts. This leads to misinformation which can undermine confidence in science and scientists in general. Unethical practices or scientific misconduct need to be checked and corrected to build scientific trust. In today's episode, a two-part series, we shall speak about scientific misconduct, how some scientists sometimes resort to misconduct by publishing fake or doctored images, and the role of scientists, scientific journals, and editors to correct this. To discuss this today, we have a very special guest, Elizabeth Big. Elizabeth, a trained microbiologist turned science integrity expert, specializes in finding manipulated images in biological and biomedical sciences publication. She's often called a super spotter and an expert in detecting manipulation in doctored images. Elizabeth, welcome to the forum and thank you for joining. Thank you, Bine, for having me here. Uh, I'm uh, happy to, uh, to do this interview. Thank you. Now let's take you back to the year 2016 when your work became visible to the outside world for the first time. You co-published a paper in the journal mBio that particular year where you analyzed more than 20,000 images published in 40 journals spanning over 20 years and found nearly 4% of those papers containing fraudulent or duplicate images. Out of those 4% of fraudulent images that you found, your other co-authors validated about 90% of those as fraudulent. Now that number is astounding for any human to do or achieve with open eye. Now tell our viewers a bit about your journey till that point and how did you come up with the idea of finding image manipulation in the first place? Yeah, so I, I started this work much earlier in 2013 when I heard a podcast about uh, plagiarism. And, and so that led me to take one of the sentences I had written in a review paper and put that into Google Scholar between quotes. And I just happened to pick by accident a sentence that somebody had indeed stolen. And so I, I, I found one plagiarized article after another. And a, a year later, I was looking at a PhD thesis with, P, with uh, plagiarized text. And again, by accident, um, noticed that one of the images had been used three times to represent three different experiments, but it was the same image. It was upside down and it was rotated. And uh, so I realized maybe I should, uh, I can, I can see these things. Maybe I have some talent and I, um, searched for duplicated images. I specifically started to look for that. So I looked at lots of papers and found more and more of these examples. That's, that's very credible. Now, as of July 2022, as per your website, your work has led to 879 retractions, 116 expressions of concern, and 952 corrections. Now, that's a very high number for anyone who does things with open eye. You do not have any specialized training in detecting faulty or doctored images, and you pretty much found that the art by doing it over a period of time. Keeping that in the background, let's broaden our discussion on some of the temptation that may compel scientists to engage in scientific misconduct. In some parts of the world, as you know, there are financial incentives or incentives to get a promotion or a tenure that may compel some scientists to engage in misconduct more than in other geographies. In that context, the role of paper mills, and you have written about those previously, is noteworthy. Can you tell our viewers what are paper mills and how do scientists engage with paper mills which ultimately damage the process of scientific integrity? Yeah, so paper mills are companies that uh, release fake papers and they ask authors to um, for money to uh, yeah to put their names on these papers. So they're fake papers, and there's different models. Some paper mills will um, plagiarize other papers and they change some words to other words. So um, they work with um, uh, synonymous text. And some other paper mills will use real images, maybe stolen from microscopes. Uh, based on a template. So they write the same paper over and over again, and it might one day, uh, one paper might be about prostate cancer and they change it to colon cancer in the next paper or to breast cancer, but it's sort of written on the same template, but they change enough wording. Um, and then uh, a third model is where papers are 
um, are being accepted. So they're real papers, they're low quality papers. But then at the last moment, the paper mill will ask uh, to add other authors. Uh, and so these authors are put onto these papers that have already been accepted in return for money. So in, in general, these paper mills make misuse of the fact that people need to publish papers. And um, yeah, if an author can maybe invest a little bit of money and then move on in their career, that is a very attractive investment. And so, um, yeah, it may, it's making misuse of the fact that people need to publish so many papers. Right. And and that really sounds horrible. And I hope that the funding agencies and the you know government in general take note of that and try to check the activities of these particular companies who are engaged in that. Now, as you know, Elizabeth, we live in an era of publish or perish. And this culture is particularly very stressful for non-tenured young faculties who want to publish because they want a promotion, they want more grants, they want students. Now, commercial publishers make billions of dollars, as we know, in profit from publishing articles that scientists submit to those journals where the publishers neither sponsor nor fund the research itself, nor do they conduct the research and write the papers. Now, despite this, we, the practicing scientists, feel dependent on the journals and the publishers. Now, without them, without these publishers, practicing integrity and punishing the bad actor, correcting the literature is impossible. Now we are talking about this 900 pound gorilla in the room. I want to ask you in this context, have you found a receptive ear among some of the publishers and journals? And if yes, which one of those have been more receptive to the work that you do and people like yourself in coming forward and finding out or investigating and correcting the literature? Well, unfortunately, I have not had a lot of uh, positive uh, response. So some of my first papers that I reported actually got quickly corrected or retracted, and that was encouraging. But overall, the response has been very low. So that initial set that I wrote in that 2016 paper you talked about in the beginning, uh, that was an initial set of 800 papers. And those 800 papers... Um, I uh, only one third of those have been corrected or retracted five years later. So after five years, after reporting these, I made up the balance and yeah, only one third had been corrected or retracted. So two thirds of these papers with, with problems that my two co-authors also agreed with, they had not been touched. And, and that is a really, really bad outcome. You would hope that, um, that these publishers that make so much money would invest some of this money to uh, to report um to yeah to try to correct these papers so that's not happening and even with my much larger data set now it's still not happening although i have my work has resulted in so many retractions the majority of these cases have not been acted upon so science is not as self-correcting as we all had hoped and um but there's not it's it's not really you cannot really say that one journal is doing better than another it seems that it varies per per paper even and some of the journals i have in my data set just have um only a few papers so i cannot really do any statistics but in general most journals are doing very poorly in uh, terms of response rate now let me press you a little bit more on that which one of those journals you found to be more receptive than others, even if, as you said, none of them is up to the mark that we expect them to, but which one is actually, in your opinion, have been more receptive? Well, most of them have not been receptive. Um, Plus One is a journal that is now doing reasonably well. Um, that's also the journal that I found the most uh, problems in not in relative numbers, but in absolute numbers, because I did scan most of my data set of 20,000 came from PLOS One, and 9,000 of those papers were from PLOS One. So that was my initial data set only in PLOS One, and later I extended to other journals. So PLOS One doesn't do uh, better or worse than the average journal does in terms of uh, percentage of prob problem problems in their papers, but they, they seem to respond now reasonably well in terms of um, yeah, following up on those cases. They hired a couple of people to deal with the backlog, but they're still retracting and correcting at a very slow rate. And um, But at least I feel they're they're trying. And some other journals are have traditionally not responded very well, but now have dedicated persons who have contacted me saying, okay, we're going to work on this backlog. We know 
we didn't respond initially very well, and now we're going to to do a little bit better. So I feel there's some improvement, but uh, yeah, in the past, they, most journals just didn't even didn't respond or only responded in a minority of the cases. Good to know that journals are coming forward. Now, as you know, Elizabeth, you are not the only person who is doing the work of finding image duplications and plagiarism in science. The difference being, you almost always do it publicly, either posting on your Twitter feed or posting it on Popier. For those who do not know, Popier is a website that discusses scientific papers post publication, often anonymously. Now, you have always signed your comments despite having the risk of being bullied intimidated or even threatened with legal action. This is the most ludicrous thing because we as scientists should be rewarding you for the work that you do and not punish you. Now tell our viewers the reason why you decided to do this the way you do, sign all your reports, and what are the disadvantages of doing it anonymously? Yeah, so I uh, I actually started uh, posting uh anonymously on papier because in the beginning I was a little bit you know less certain of my myself I didn't have had built up any reputation yet so I did my initial comments public uh, under a you know I was peer one so it's an anonymous um, account but uh, now I post everything publicly I have always written to editors under my full name and I feel posting under your full name gives much more weight to what I say because it shows that I'm willing to risk a lot, and I it shows that I'm uh, that I'm writing everything, and I'm responsible for what I write. So I I I tend to write in a polite way as much as I can. Uh, I feel a lot of anonymous person, as we all know. When you're anonymous, you tend to push the boundary of uh, politeness a little bit, or you cross it even. Uh, we all know trolls on Twitter. But if you sign things with your full name, it gives weight, it gives, um, yeah, believability, and um, and and people uh, then also can give me credit, which is also nice because for anonymous person, I know that a lot of them would love to get credit, but they they choose the anonymous model, and I can totally see that, especially if you're early career researcher, it could be very damaging. Uh, to be a whistleblower. I get a lot of pushback. I'm already later in my career, I but I don't have a um, a boss who tells me what to do or what not to do. I'm independent. And so it gives me a lot of freedom to do whatever I like. Um, but yeah, I also have, of course, to bear the responsibility. If I make one mistake, I will be uh, publicly, you know, held accountable for that. And I so I try to do it when I feel I'm very certain of my case. I'm very concerned about this image. I will sign this with my full name. That's how certain I am that there is a concern. I can't agree with you more that signing with the full name brings more credibility to the report. It also tells the other person there must be some honesty, some facts, what this person is trying to find out or telling us. And But at the same time, as you mentioned, the risk could be there if you're an early career researcher signing it because you're looking for a promotion, a grant, a tenure. Now, I want to let our viewers know that if there is a manipulated image, it's not always a deliberate act on the part of a scientist. Honest mistakes do happen, and as you mentioned before, science should be self-correcting. In addition, science can be dynamic, meaning our knowledge may change as you discover more about certain things. For example, what we know about how the spread of a particular disease today may change over a period of time as you discover new facts about the positivism mm -hmm. presence. Now, scientists unknowingly and inadvertently sometimes come to a wrong conclusion. This is not misconduct. This is how it should be, because science is self-correcting. They should let people know, particularly in the community, that there has been some mistake and new data has been gathered. We are only talking about the acts that are done deliberately and knowingly to boost one's prospect to become famous, win an award, or a promotion. That brings us to the next question on policy. Elizabeth, in some countries, funding organizations and institutions, they have instituted science integrity policy or the Office of Research Integrity. In your experience and your knowledge, which country or the institution practices is the best? And where do you see the whole Office of Science Integrity going in the future? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I uh, unfortunately have not a lot of good experiences for any country, 
um, in terms of uh, correcting or addressing these issues. And that is because most of these cases are still investigated within uh, an institution. So they're not really investigated on a countrywide level. And that, of course, brings all kinds of conflicts of interest. So I have had a very good experience, but that seems to be an exception of a Czech, Czech Republic university where there was a committee formed that wasn't just from that university. It also involved members from the outside and even from different countries. And so it was more an international committee. And there the investigation was very quick was very uh, to the point, there was indeed a conclusion that there was misconduct and some papers were um, recommended to be retracted. So that was a very good experience where it wasn't held indoors. So um, there are some other good uh, developments. For example, Sweden is developing a, or has um, instituted a organization that will do countrywide investigations, but it's very, new it's only a couple of years so i think it's too early to know if they're going to do better but i would expect that that's the case because if you let institutions investigate these cases they're going to keep everything indoors and they often come to the conclusion that maybe a junior person did something wrong but they seem to protect the people who are in more powerful positions the even though they might be responsible the professors who bring in money are of course uh, very valuable for a university. So it's very rare that a university would would um, find these people in the end uh, guilty of misconduct. They seem to be protected. Now, as you know, there is all saying that the thief has to be smarter than the police to be successful. And in that sense, the guys who are involved in faking images or involved in plagiarism are getting smarter. Now let's admit it. Some of the image manipulation done a decade back looks pretty silly today. And you may ask how stupid a person can be just to put two images together and think nobody else is going to find out. Mm -hmm. But technology has evolved and is evolving as we speak to the point sometimes getting those fake images identified may become very tough. What do you think in the future, do you think getting those images identified, finding out those doctor images, is it going to be easy? And if it isn't, what are we going to do as scientists to find those fake cases? Yeah, I'm going to give a very pessimistic answer, uh, but you're right. I mean, the 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 fraudsters are getting smarter, and of course, technology enables them to to make much better fake images. We we already know how good artificial intelligence and, and other software is in, in terms of generating images that look pretty real. And just think of Jurassic Park because the, the dinosaurs are, with every movie, they, they look better, right? They look more realistic. And so it is totally possible nowadays to make uh, photos that look realistic, for example, of faces, human faces. So there's a website called this person doesn't exist.com and it will generate a new face every time you click on refresh. And these are not real persons. They're, they're generated by a computer. And so it's also very easy to make a photo of cells by using um, AI tools. And Dell E is one that is very popular now where you can just uh, sort of text-based AI tool to generate anything you want it to generate. And these are not duplicated images, so they're not really detectable with software. Um, they don't, they're unique images, but maybe they leave some in, uh, some fingerprint and maybe we need to um, to go to a model where you we can prove that it's really that photo that was taken from a microscope or so. Maybe we can think about a fingerprint that a microscope puts on a photo to show that it's real, or maybe have these AI tools only be uh, allowed to operate if they if they make it uh, some digital fingerprint to make sure that you we know it's a fake image. You can think of different solutions, but it is going to be much harder to catch the fraudsters because they're they seem to be always a, a step ahead, and and then we can detect may, maybe whatever they did a couple of years ago, but we cannot yet detect what they're doing right now. And so I'm a bit pessimistic, and we might in the end go towards a model where people can only know that a paper is real when we are able to replicate it. And that might be a completely new way of um, of looking at science papers. Absolutely. And you're right. Uh, probably we have to be more smarter than the fraudsters. And there may be ways of technology 
to be developed where we can put fingerprints, as you said, or watermarks so that we can detect mm -hmm. those images to be real. Now, a related question to that is, as softwares and tools are getting developed and implemented by organizations and societies, publishers and journals, do you think that the work that you do and people like yourself will become obsolete with those tools? Uh, I hope not, but <laughs> that would mean uh, we're out of work, but maybe that's a good thing. Um, no, because you still need a human to, to operate those software uh, programs. Um, even plagiarism, you cannot just automatically have a paper screen for plagiarism and just accept the results because it's there. there's all kinds of interpretations that still need to be do, done by a human, I feel, at least in the current phases of the software. Uh, for example, uh, the software that I'm starting to use um, will generate a lot, lot of false positives. So when you have photos that are taken by microscope um, of samples that are treated with different probes with different colors or dyes. You usually have three photos with, you know, dye A and dye B and then a merged photo. And these are always duplicates of each other because there's elements in each of these photos that are um, overlapping. And so the software will flag that. And it is indeed a duplication. It's just not an inappropriate duplication. So you still need a human to distinguish um, the false positives from the real positives, um, at least in the current version. And so that I feel is not going to be, um, you know, we, we, we're still needed as humans to interpret these results. Absolutely. And I just want to let our you know, viewers know that there was a time maybe a decade back when artificial intelligence and medical image uh, analysis came into picture. People are thinking that pathologists who are doing report, reporting and radiologists, their jobs are going to be obsolete, but it hasn't. In fact, their role has become even more important. So mm -hmm. you would need expert humans like yourself, even in the presence of expert software and tools. Now, let's move to the second part of our interview. And here I'm going to talk about India. As you know, I work in India in one of the largest, more prominent public universities. In this aspect, I want to tell our viewers that even India lacks a government organization or an institution appointed body to look into scientific integrity. The organization like Society for Scientific Values or SSV have been doing a stellar job for the last 30 years. In fact, it's not very well known about what they do, but I can tell you that the SSV has done such a good job. They have found the fraudulent practices and plagiarized papers of many of the most prominent scientists and they have brought that into the public domain. Unfortunately, it is not regulatory in nature. And what they do and the recommendation that they find is actually cannot be implemented. They can only put that in the public domain. Now, speaking of which, Elizabeth, have you been contacted by any Indian organization or institution to look into a set of papers or a particular paper in the past? No, I have not been uh, contacted as a consultant uh, to uh, to look at these cases from India. I have been working for institutions in the US and uh, Canada and in uh, several European countries, but not in any Asian country. Um, and, and so, but I have been contacted by people working at uh, certain Indian institutions, sort of whistleblowers um, telling me that there were certain universities where people were encouraged to publish as much as possible no matter how they did it and uh, sure enough I found lots of examples of plagiarized text and manipulated images from that particular university and this was sort of an attempt to end up higher in the rankings of the university which uh, these rankings are very heavily weighed towards how many paper um, a university publishes and so I think they were trying to end up higher in the rankings and unfortunately, yeah, there seems to be no uh, investigation into any of these cases. So the university might be in the loop because they never responded to my emails of uh, reporting these papers. But I have not done any consulting for um, an Indian university. I, of course, hope that that might be the case one day. And uh, thank you for the free publicity. <laughs> no, I think, but, I, uh, think I, I certainly hope that uh, people who are watching this interview and uh, your work is very well known, very well appreciated. I hope that people take your professional advice in finding those papers which are fraudulent or the doctored images and take corrective actions. And I must say that the important thing here is not to find the person who did it and punish him or her, they, 
But the most important thing is that once we find and establish mm -hmm. that there are doctored images, the papers needs to be retracted. So the correction right. of scientific literature is more important than punishing and finding out the culprit. Mm -hmm. Now, let me ask you the second question on this. Have you seen any journal articles? And I'm sure you scan hundreds of them, so you probably don't remember each of those. But tell us recently, any of the papers from Indian authors, from Indian institutions that stands out in your view? Well, there's one one particular image that I use a lot in my, uh, in my presentations that comes from an Indian uh, university. And it's an image of nanoparticles. And so these are scanning electron microscopy photos, usually uh, used in those papers. And this one particular photo I have in mind has a lot of duplications. And so if you see the image, for me, it's very obvious. It's all duplicated, but I show it in my uh, presentations. And then my next slide is the same image, but I've marked it for duplication. So there's lots of duplicated um, circles in all kinds of colors. And there's usually a an audible response from the audience when I show that image where like everybody's, whoa, that's that's so amazing. And this paper got cited uh, a couple of hundred times. And uh, so it seemed to be somewhat influential and it uh, has recently be, been retracted, but it took a long time of me uh, pounding on the door of the editor and then the editor trying to get it done by the publishers. And uh, I don't know, there was some long delay, but it finally got retracted. That's good to know. Now, have you ever received any email, phone call, or any other communication from an Indian author which you are investigating the work of, threatening you or telling you to piss off or telling you to mind your own business? Because I know you have heard <laughs> that from multiple different authors and institutions. Have you ever received any such emails or communications from Indian authors from working in Indian institutions? Not that I remember, but <laughs> I have gotten indeed a lot of, no, not, not that many. Uh, per email, I don't get that many threats. I'm not trying to publish my email address um, in a lot of places, but of course it is findable. Uh, you know, I think most people from India are pretty uh, um, polite. Uh, I've gotten a couple of nasty replies from uh, US researchers though, but uh, not from India and um uh, there's also no bullying online from Indian institutions, um, but there are a couple of other groups. Uh, one group from France is uh, really on my tail and another group from uh, the US. Uh, these are investors in a particular stock. Uh, so there's a couple of groups that seem to be very uh, determined to keep on bullying me and they don't seem to go away even if you don't respond, but not from India. So I hope that's good to know for your audience. Good to know that. Now, mm -hmm. um in addition to the doctored images, as you know, for plagiarism, particularly text plagiarism, including images as well, there are websites like PubPeer and Retraction Watch that actually keep these things under watch by letting us know what they find. Do you think, particularly for a country like India, we are large, although our scientific output is not that large because the amount of money that the public exchequer spends on R&D is still minuscule. In fact, it's only less than 0.7% of our GDP. As we grow economically, we expect more money to come in research. As more money come to research, we expect more publications. And as there are more publications, we expect more doctored images in those publications or plagiarized text. What would be your advice to the Indian institutions, regulatory bodies, policymakers, and the government? What is the best way to go forward with in checking those kind of practices and to put the best scientific integrity practices in place? Um, yeah, I think it's it should be a combination of training people uh, and not just the junior people, the, the people who are just starting their career, but also training and holding responsible the older generation, the, the more senior scientists. So training, I think, is a very good thing. You want people to know what they can and cannot do. And um, some of these rules are obvious, but you also don't want people to say, oh, I had no idea I could not do plagiarism. Like you need to tell that to people to make sure that they're, they're you know, if they if they use other people's tax, they need to do it in a responsible way. And there's pretty clear rules for that that are, I believe, internationally accepted. So that is one thing, training, but then also taking action. When there are allegations of misconduct, I feel a government that actually takes appropriate action and 
uh, have advice to retract papers and maybe uh, fire people and uh, maybe having some way of getting money back if, if they, you know, owned, if they got a lot of grant money, like, uh, you know, and it's misconduct, how do we get that money back that came from the, our government? So having a government that does really well in uh, having consequences for these types of misconduct, that also would be really well received because I feel in a university or a government that looks the other way is actually encouraging misconduct. So, you know, if there weren't any rules for speeding, for example, everybody would be speeding if uh, everybody would be crossing red lights, but knowing that you could get a ticket that works really well to keep everybody sort of polite on the road. So rules that are enforced will work really well, but yeah, it's uh, training alone. It's not going to do it. I hope the government and the policymakers are listening. I can tell you from the past practices, we had several sham committees. The committees meet, yeah. they make recommendations which are very, very superficial. Often the person who is indulged in such practices of doctoring images of plagiarism never punished. In fact, there are cases, and it's a completely new episode I may do in the future, people are actually promoted because they had a big cloud, as mm -hmm. you mentioned, they're big guys, big names, nobody wants to, you know, like touch them. And in fact, that is the exact practices you should be done away with. And we should institute the faith among common citizens on science and scientific practices so that we put science at the highest impact. Now, let me turn the table back and ask you, have you ever been contacted by any individual scientist who have found a mistake or a doctored image in some of the papers which are basically been put together by a graduate student or a postdoc or somebody in the lab and say, hey, you know what, I think this image could be wrong, this is something fuzzy, which I actually didn't find out or figure it out before, would you actually mind having a look at it? Yes, I mean, I get I get a lot of um, tips and contacts. Most of these are about papers that have been published already and by other groups. But occasionally I will get emails from people who say, I suspect that a person in my lab is uh, doctoring something. Um, but often they don't really have any hard evidence. So it's more that they observe certain things or they say, this paper got published, but I know it's not that cell line as they claim in the paper, it's a different cell line or it's images that are actually a completely different experiment. And so they, they have inside information, but it's really hard for me to respond to that. Well, I, I'll, I'll respond, but I cannot really do much about it because this is inside information. If you would look at the paper, it looks fine. Um, it looks, you know, it's experiment, it's photos, there's no duplication or image manipulation that I can see. But if a person tells me that's not that cell line, but something else, that is inside information. And the, if you, if I would report that to somebody in their institution, then the person who did it knows that it's, that it's probably a person sitting next to them doing that, or like a person very close to them. And so it, it's, uh, really risky for the whistleblower to proceed with that because there's only one or two persons who might have known that as well. And so it's very um, risky for, for those pe people to continue. So I usually will tell them if it's not obvious from the paper, I would just contact the, your ombudsperson or your research integrity officer very carefully, but make sure you have some, some proof and make sure you, if you report it, to do it very objectively. Don't yell things like fraud or, uh, you know, that person is uh, is a bad person. Um, gather your information, make maybe photos of lab books and photos of what was published and things like that. Keep track of emails and do everything um, in a way that you don't get noticed, even maybe not send emails from your university network because that's all traceable to you. And so those are the only tips I can give them. I cannot really do much unless it's visible from the paper. Right. Now, there are texts in addition to images as far as plagiarism is concerned, and you mentioned about some of those before. There are websites, as we talked before, like Popier, Retraction Watch, which also talks about some of those doctored papers, you know, texts and images. 
Now, do you see in the future that these organizations will work together with people like yourselves and others to solve the class? And if it is the case, do you see any initiative anywhere else in the world where there has been some efforts from the top to put together a list of experts, a list of websites or companies who actually will do a better job in finding doctored papers, plagiarism, and work towards scientific integrity? No, I, th I think that currently Popier is the best platform. Um, it's the it's pretty much the only platform you can use to comment on. And so people doing what I do and, and or similar things will quickly find Popier and will comment on these papers. Uh, but of course, there are individuals who might write a blog post about a particular case. I was reading one today where a person just gathers information about one particular author and, and uh, sort of claims that they're working without permits and things like that. And so there's different aspects. I work on image duplication. Other people work on uh, plagiarism or on lack of ethical approval or on statistical errors. And, and most of us might publish on, on our own blog uh, blogs or on other websites, but we, we tend to all come together to Papier because I believe that's currently the best platform to, uh, and by far the biggest platform to comment on. Um, if there are any other cases, I'm, it, I think the way that, that Papier works really well is because it's run by people like me, about volunteers. Uh, I would uh, assume that if it's really run by an official organization, it would end up in bureaucracy and uh, things being censored. Um, so I think it's best to have this currently run as a independent organization. Right. Thank you. And Elizabeth, to our last questions. We, the practicing scientists, have outsourced the job to people like yourself. And we should be that we should be doing ourselves. And you do that quite selflessly. What you do is absolutely praiseworthy and courageous to start with when you had to quit your paid job and find fraudulent images full time without being paid. Now, looking back, do you have any regrets or knowing what you know today? Would you have done anything differently? Uh, no regrets at all. No, I would do it again in a heartbeat. I'm actually, um, I'm not directly paid <laughs> because this is uh, something I've, I want to make sure I'm, I'm as independent as possible, but I have a Patreon account so people donate small amounts of, of money. And so this comes without any conditions. Uh, they just support me, you know, do whatever you like. We'll give you $5 a month or so. And so to gather all these smaller amounts and some bigger amounts add up. And so that actually provides me with the financial means to keep on doing this work. And so I'm very grateful for people who, who donate, maybe they're postdocs or graduate students and they can only miss $1 or one euro a month and that's totally fine i'm very very grateful for every little contribution because it allows me to not have to worry about can i find a consulting job this this week uh, i can i can focus on any case that crosses my path i still work from a lot of tips and i don't have to worry about the financial consequences of quitting my job excellent with that very good note it's time to end our today's discussion elizabeth i want to thank you for your generous time and telling our viewers why science integrity is important and why it is paramount for scientists, publishers, and funding agencies to be watchful for those who indulge in activities of misconduct and encourage the work of people like yourself. Thank you once again, and goodbye. Thank you, Vinay, for uh, having me here. I enjoyed it.